You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Oh, excuse me. I wonder if you'd have the time to take part in some market research. Um, what's it about? About this club and your experiences and opinions about being a member. It'll take less than five minutes. Oh, okay then. As long as it's quick. <laughs> Can I start by taking your name? It's Selina Thompson. Is that T H O M P S O N? Yes. Okay. Great. Thanks. And what do you do for a living? Well, I'm an accountant, but I'm between jobs at the moment. I understand, but that's the job I'll put down on the form. And would you mind my asking which age group you fall into? Below thirty, thirty-one to fifty, and above. Over fifty, <laughs> I think we can safely say. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thanks. And which type of membership do you have? Sorry, I'm not sure what you mean. Do you mean how long? Of no, is it a single person membership? Oh right, no, it's a family membership. <laughs> thanks. And how long have you been a member? Oh, let me see.、Uh, I was certainly here five years ago, and it was probably. Two to three years more than that.、Mm -hmm. Shall I put down eight? Oh, I remember now. It's nine, definitely. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no problem. I've got that. And the last question in this first part is: What brought you to the club?、Uh, Sorry.、Uh, how did you find out about the club? Did you see any ads? Well,、uh, I, I did actually. But I have to say, I wasn't really attracted to the club because of that. It was through word of mouth. So you were recommended by a friend? <laughs> Actually, my doctor.、Oh. I'd been suffering from high blood pressure, and he said the club was very supportive of people with that condition. So, I signed up.、Mm, great, thanks. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions six to ten. Now listen and answer questions six to ten. Now, for the second part of the form, I want to ask a bit more about your experience of the club. Sure.、Uh, how often would you say you use the club? <sighs> It varies enormously, depending on how busy I am.、Mm, of course, but on average, per month. I'd say it averages out at twice a week. Okay, so eight on average. Yeah, and four of those are aqua aerobics classes. That leads me to the next question. Would you say the swimming pool is the facility you make most use of? Fair to say that. Yep. Right. Thanks. And are there any facilities you don't use? Hmm. One area I realise I've never used is the tennis courts,、mm. and there's one simple reason for that. You don't play tennis. <laughs> Actually, I'm not bad at it.、Oh. It's that I'm not happy having to pay extra for that privilege. Ah,、oh, right. I've made a note of that. Thanks.、Mm. <clears throat> Now, in the last section, are there any suggestions or recommendations you have for improvements to the club? Only about health and fitness. Anything at all. Well, I'd like to see more social events.、Oh. It isn't just a question of getting together for games or classes, but other things, you know. Yes,、yeah, sure. And another thing that I was thinking when I had my yoga class in the gym last night, we were all sweltering in the heat. Was that I think they should put in, or、well, you know,、uh, air conditioning.、Uh, that's exactly what I mean.、Mm. The rooms are really light and well designed, but they do need proper installations. Sure. Well, I've made a note of that. Good. So, is there anything else you'd like to suggest、uh, about quality of service, for example? Oh, everyone's very nice here. They couldn't be more friendly and helpful. Oh, but I tell you what. 
It's a shame the restaurant isn't open in the evening on Saturday. And Sunday as well, for that matter. Oh. So the club should... Yeah, open it later on those days. OK. Well, thank you very much. That's <laughs> all the questions I have. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. Hello, welcome to Pine Garden. My name is Manuel, and I'd like to tell you a few things about our establishment before you all wander off and begin your exploration of the grounds. I know you're keen to begin, so I'll try to keep this short. First of all, I'd like to explain what you can do with your ticket. If you want to be closer to nature, you could visit our planting area. In that area, visitors can plant small flowers and bulbs that will grow and become part of the garden. The planting activity is completely free. Uh, however, if you have sensitive hands, you'll need to purchase garden gloves to protect your skin. Here at Pine Garden, we sell a number of wooden goods carved from trees that have been felled in our very own pine forest. If you feel like getting involved and having a go yourself, you can join one of our bush timbering lessons free of charge where you'll be able to make your own keyring under the supervision of a skilled craftsman. The most popular attraction in the garden is our aviary, where you can observe a whole range of bird species. Entry to this section is free, but you have to pay a small supplement in order to enter the hummingbird section. Also, the insect hut not far from it may arouse your interest. There you can find some interesting insects such as butterflies, pocket ladybugs, dragonflies and so on and there's no extra charge for that. Unfortunately, there are some areas that are temporarily off limits to visitors today. For example, the gift shop that closed earlier this year and won't be open for another month or so. As I mentioned before, however, you're free to visit our restaurant for food and snacks. And if you're looking to purchase a gift, why not buy that special someone a potted bush or orchid from our plant care center? And our new treetop cafe is under construction which will be very impressive when it's finished. In fact, the model town's already opened ahead of schedule, and it's attracting a lot of people. Now, our tourist office is normally available to provide tourists with a variety of help. However, the officer is sick at home today. Please do not let this discourage you from visiting these, as they provide quite an experience. Before you hear the rest of the talk, You'll have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. I also would like to introduce you to our plant specialists who are responsible for the wonderful plant displays here at Pine Garden. And Mrs Mary is one of our experts and she is personally responsible for our beautiful display of plants that are all found growing naturally in the local area. Mr. Burson has the difficult task of growing varieties of plants that are suited to much drier and hotter climates than ours, which means we do not have to store water on site. If you visit the glass house, you'll be able to see many plants that he has managed to cultivate without the need for rain or irrigation. Mr. Smith is responsible for the produce that you can eat in our restaurant, which ranges from varieties that grow under the ground to those that grow on trees and bushes. Now, Mr. Nooney here is our expert on the most commonly growing plant in the world, grass. 
You may have noticed how beautifully green and lush our grounds are, thanks to his specialist knowledge. Mr Scanlon ensures that our soil is full of nutrients, so that the natural habitat is supported and encouraged. He does this by fertilising the earth with a special formula of his own creation. Finally, I would like to introduce you all to Dr Mandelson. He is the manager of our landscaping team and works closely with our other experts to ensure that everyone works together to create a landscape that is both beautiful and sustainable. Well, that just about rounds it up. Now, if anyone has any questions... That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear Sally and Mike, two students. Now it turns to part three. Part three. Part three. You will hear a tutor and some students talking about an assignment. Listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Come in. Sit down. Good to see you. Hello. Hello. Now, this assignment. The best thing we can do, I think, is to think how we can approach it. The main point is to investigate television, but not what's happened in the past. I was thinking that it would be necessary to go over the new media first mm. and then... Yes, that's a way to make a start, but you need to do that quite briefly. But it's quite a complex topic. Though. Yeah, I agree, but the emphasis must be on the future development of television as a cultural phenomenon. Yes. I've been reading the talk by Ashley Highfield. All right, and what do you take from that? What are the things that are competing with television? Well, to start with, there is the games console, then there is the personal computer and the internet, um, then again the mobile phone with its capability of games and puzzles... Mm. Um, and, of course, internet access. Lastly, there is the iPod, with the possibility of listening to music wherever you go. Good. You've understood that. Now, which of these presents the greatest competition for television? Well, according to the research, it's video games. Yes, that's true at present. But in the future... I think the phone will present the greatest threat then. And why? Because it's mobile, portable, and it's developing fast. Yeah, I think you're right. You need always to look to the future and try to assess how things will develop, as we said. Good. Now, you need to move on to the new social trends in connection with television. Is one of them the idea that programmes might become shorter and shorter? Ah, yes. The, the average programme might be ten minutes. Or even less. Just mini programmes, say, four to five minutes long. Now... Do you think you can get access to all the materials you need? The problem at the moment is the library. Oh, yes. What's happening there? There's a tremendous amount of noise because of the new extension they are building. It's quite impossible to work there. They are stopping work for a week next week, I believe, and then all the sections will be open. There's a hold-up because some roof tiles have not arrived, so there'll be peace for that week. But then after that, the media studies section will be closed for a week and all the noise and dirt will start up again. Yes, the sociology section will be open and there's some good stuff there for you on this topic and it's further away from the noise. Mm. Yes, I don't think the sociology section is affected at all and neither is the journal section. No, 
Obviously, they're rotating the closures, and it was sociology's turn to close for a week last term. I think we should make a complaint. Yeah, I think you should. I've had a word with the library staff. They are very sympathetic, but they are affected by these works just as we are. If I were you, I'd make a complaint directly to the premises committee. They only meet once a year, but in fact, I know they're having a meeting next Tuesday. You might like to make contact with them, but don't say that I suggested this. <laughs> yes, but the students' union might be better since they are independent of the university. That's true, but I can't imagine that people haven't already approached them about this.、Mm. Let's try the premises committee. Good idea. Why not? Okay. Now, don't forget, I need a copy of your dissertations by email and two copies in print. That is on paper. If you give the Reprographics Office twenty-four hours' notice, they'll make copies for you. And if you give them my details, they'll send those copies directly to me. They won't send copies to you, so you'll need to take your own copy personally from them. Good. Any questions? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions twenty-seven to thirty. Now answer questions twenty-seven to thirty. One little thing was just that I wondered whether we should actually talk about that famous website, you know the one YouTube. Ah, I was rather hoping you hadn't overlooked that. <sighs> Good point. It's mostly homemade videos. I suppose you could say that each video is a television version of a podcast. Anything else? Yes, I've got a question. I'm afraid, I'm not completely clear about the exact meaning of culture. As we are using it in this subject. Well, Mrs. Jones is giving a lecture on culture and society in the University Theatre. It's on Wednesday at 10 a.m., and you can learn all about it there. I'm sure. Can you give us that again, please? Yes, that's culture and society. It's in the University Theatre, and、um, let me just check the time. Yes, here it is, 10 a.m. on Wednesday. She'll be giving a very thorough discussion of the issues in defining what culture means. Right. That's good.、Uh, the thing is, the reading list confused me a bit. One thing that occurred to me was that it might be broken down into subsections for future students. Yes, that's a fair point. I'll bear that in mind. Now, don't forget, you need to do the reading and finish the assignment by the fourth of July. Is that okay? Fine. Thank you very much. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. When we look at theories of education and learning, we see a constant shifting of views as established theories are questioned and refined, or even replaced. And we can see this very clearly in the way that attitudes towards bilingualism have changed. Let's start with a definition of bilingualism. And for our purposes today, we can say it's the ability to communicate with the same degree of proficiency in at least two languages. Now, in practical terms, this might seem like a good thing, something we'd all like to be able to do. However, early research done with children in the USA, in fact, suggested that being bilingual interfered in some way with learning and with the development of their mental processes. And so, in those days, bilingualism was regarded as something to be avoided, and parents were encouraged to bring their children up as monolingual, just speaking one language. But this research, which took place in the early part of the 20th century, is now regarded as unsound for various reasons. 
mainly because it didn't take into account other factors such as the children's social and economic backgrounds. Now, in our last lecture, we were looking at some of the research that's been done into the way children learn, into their cognitive development, and in fact we believe now that the relationship between bilingualism and cognitive development is actually a positive one. It turns out that cognitive skills such as problem solving, which don't seem at first glance to have anything to do with how many languages you speak, are better among bilingual children than monolingual ones. And quite recently, there's been some very interesting work done by Ellen Bialystok at York University in Canada. She's been doing various studies on the effects of bilingualism, and her findings provide some evidence that they might apply to adults as well. They're not just restricted to children. So how do you go about investigating something like this? Well... Dr Bialystok used groups of monolingual and bilingual subjects aged from 30 right up to 88. For one experiment, she used a computer program which displayed either a red or a blue square on the screen. The coloured square could come up on either the left hand or the right hand side of the screen. If the square was blue, the subject had to press the left shift key on the keyboard and if the square was red, they had to press the right shift key. So they didn't have to react at all to the actual position of the square on the screen, just to the colour they saw. And she measured the subject's reaction times by recording how long it took them to press the shift key and how often they got it right. What she was particularly interested in was whether it took the subject longer to react when a square lit up on one side of the screen, say the left, and the subject had to press the shift key on the right-hand side. She'd expected that it would take more processing time than if a square lit up on the left and the candidates had to press a left key. This was because of a phenomenon known as the Simon effect, where basically the brain gets a bit confused because of conflicting demands being made on it. In this case, seeing something on the right and having to react on the left. And this causes a person's reaction times to slow down. The results of the experiment showed that the bilingual subjects responded more quickly than the monolingual ones. That was true both when the squares were on the correct side of the screen, so to speak, and even more so when they were not. So bilingual people were better able to deal with the Simon effect than the monolingual ones. So what's the explanation for this? Well, the results of the experiment suggest that bilingual people are better at ignoring information which is irrelevant to the task in hand and just concentrating on what's important. One suggestion given by Dr Bialystok was that it might be because someone who speaks two languages can suppress the activity of parts of the brain when it isn't needed. In particular, the part that processes whichever language isn't being used at that particular time. Well, she then went on to investigate that with a second experiment. But again, the bilingual group performed better. And what was particularly interesting, and this is, I think, why the experiments have received so much publicity, is that in all cases, the performance gap between monolinguals and bilinguals actually increased with age, which suggests that bilingualism protects the mind against decline. So in some way, the lifelong experience of managing two 